Proverbs chapter 26. We'll begin reading in verse number 20. The Bible says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail, tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot sheared covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We enjoyed the good singing. Enjoyed the youth choir singing. It was a blessing, Father. Enjoyed the special singing. God, we're thankful that you're a God of grace, God of mercy, a God that's long-suffering, a God that shows loving kindness. Father, we do not deserve your goodness and grace towards us, but we do greatly appreciate it. Now, Father, as we come to you this morning, we come asking that, Lord, for the next few minutes, you'd put a hedge about us. We know the devil is the thief that cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. And he'd like to rob people of their joy and of their testimony. He'd like to certainly steal the word of God out of our heart before it begins to take root. And Father, he wants to divide and distract your children. So I pray for the next few minutes that you'd bind him in the powers of hell. I pray that as the word of God goes forth that it would speak to every heart. Lord, I pray that uh, it go far beyond our minds and our intellect, but it would speak to our heart. Uh, and Father, I do pray that, Lord, if there's any amongst us today who are unsaved, they're strangers to the grace of God, uh, they've never been born again, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. I pray that the sweet Holy Spirit of God would roll the scales off of them, their eyes uh, so they can see their lost condition. And I pray that today would be the day they'd give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I pray for those that are saved, those that are blood washed, born again. I pray that, Lord, you'd speak to their hearts. You know their needs. Uh, Lord, some uh, may need revived. Uh, some may need to draw closer. Some may need some specific uh, uh, answer to a prayer in their life. Uh, some may be struggling, just need you to come prop them up. Uh, some might need encouragement. Uh, some might need reassurance. Uh, Father, whatever the need is, I know the sweet Holy Ghost of God through his office work knows how to minister to hearts. Uh, we ask that you do that this very hour. Uh, Father, I pray now uh, you'd receive glory, you'd receive honor. Uh, I certainly do pray that you'd use this unworthy vessel, uh, and I pray the word of God would go forth as you see fit. Uh, help me to say everything you'd have me to say, uh, and God help me not to say anything contrary to the word or will of God. Uh, bless now, help your people. Uh, bless those that are sick. Be with Big Doug's daughter, Kimberly. Uh, Father, be with Brother Jim. Touch him and help him. Uh, Father, I pray for those that are traveling, those of our church that are on vacation traveling. Uh, God, give them a good time away, and God, uh, bless them while they're away and bring them back to us safely. Uh, now, Father, have your way, and we'll bless you for it, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, there are three things I want you to see as a way of introduction from this text. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, the hostility and strife. Uh, look again at verse number 20, where there, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. We know that if you got a fire and you don't keep putting wood on it, eventually it's going to burn out. Uh, the Bible says, so where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Uh, I, I, I've been in church all my life, uh, been saved 49 years. Uh, and one thing I know, if you got somebody who's a tail bearer, uh, somebody who's constantly talking about people in the church, uh, there'll be strife. Uh, there'll be things that get stirred up uh, that'll hinder the work of God. 
God. Uh, what a blessing when there's no talebearer. Uh, what a burden when there is. Uh, uh, it goes on to say in uh, uh, verse number uh, uh, 22, uh, 21, as coals are, are, are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kin kindle strife. Uh, can I say, uh, when somebody's got to burn their saddle, they got a way of making people miserable. They got a way of stirring things up. Uh, uh, when you have somebody who is contentious, who is looking for a fight, he's not going to be satisfied till he gets a fight. Uh, there are folks that are that way. There are folks that just have a nasty disposition. And you can't please them, uh, and they're constantly wanting to stir people up. Uh, and somehow, some way, sometimes end up in churches. Hmm? You'd think folks would come to church because they know it's a holy place. It's a place that's been set apart to the honor and glory of God. Uh, you'd think folks would realize church is a place of worship. A uh, uh, church is a place where we come to get help. Uh, it's an oasis from this wicked world. A uh, uh, church is where truth will be expounded upon. Uh, but yet there are some... Uh, I guess there was a book came out, somebody wrote that uh, a book said, Everything that I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. There are some people that if they don't get the right color of paint, if they don't get the most attention from the teacher, if they don't get to learn how to tie their shoes first, they're going to cause problems. Miss Nett and I watched that show, uh, uh, it's on, I think, on Discovery, where a uh, family has, uh, what, six kids? Babies, and then they had three other children, but they had six babies at one time. Six tuplets, huh? Yeah, it's a madhouse all the time. It's funny watching them people pull their hair out as them kids are really controlling all that, huh? But those, those kids, they all want the attention of their parents, and they all deserve that, but it's hard for the parents to give them attention when they're having to spread it out over six. And it's amazing. There's one, they call him Blue. I don't know why they call him Blue. He's not Blue, but they call him Blue. And he's a booger. They take their eyes off of him. He's standing up on top of the table. He's, he's climbing the, up the side, the back way of the stairs, going upstairs. He's, he's all the time into something because he's a booger. And can I say, there are people in church, if you don't constantly keep your eye on them, they can be a booger. Uh, so we find that he says... Uh, Mm, verse 22, the words of a talebearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Can I say, when somebody starts spreading stuff on people and the person finds out about it, it's a wound. Amen. Mm? Uh, let me just be, just see a show of hands here today. Now we're all, we're all here in church and we might as well be honest. How many have been hurt in church? Look at the hands. Been hurt in church. You think the safest place in the world would be the house of God. But can I say that as gracious and wonderful God is, and as gracious and wonderful as most of his people are, there are still people that hurt people in churches. Huh? I don't have time to turn there, but James talks about this tongue being set on fire from hell. And a lot of people that get wounded in church, Brother Seth, it's not because somebody pulls out a knife and cuts them. It's that tongue. Somebody running their mouth about somebody. And most of the time, Brother Bob, you've been around as long as I have, most of the time the people that are telling the tales only get partial truth out. They don't get the whole picture. Hmm? Uh Miss Annette's got a wonderful thing. I wish I'd adhere to it. She put it in the kids, but I wish I'd adhere to it more. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Hmm? That'd be a good thing to live by, wouldn't it, Brother Brian? Well, then start living by it, okay? Oh, huh? yeah, all right. But we see hostility and strife. Strife in a church is never good, and neither is hostility. Church ought never be a war zone. Church ought to be a love zone. It's where folks come and love one another because the love of God is there. So we see hostility and strife, but we also find in these verses a heart that's sinful. Look at verse 23. Burning lips and a wicked heart 
or like a pot sheared cover with silver dross. Can I say that a wicked heart, a heart that's sinful, is going to have burning lips? They can't wait to stir up strife because that's what's in their heart. Hmm? Uh, and I've learned this, Brother Phil, when you call them on the carpet, it's amazing how all of a sudden it's God's will for them to leave. Hmm? They don't like getting right because they have a sinful heart. Hmm? When you confront a sinful heart, one of two things has to happen. That heart has to be converted. It has to change. Or that heart goes. And a lot of times, those people end up going and they go somewhere else because it's in their heart to wound people. We see a, hosti a hostility and strife. We see a heart that's sinful. But also I find in these verses hatred that is sinister. Look at verse 24. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. In other words, if you've got hate in your heart, you divide people. Amen. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. Huh? You know, I think I heard Gomer Pyle say one time, loose lips sink ships. I may remember Gomer Pyle. Amen. I'll pray for you, all right? <laughs> uh, everybody needs a little Sergeant Carter in their life. But it's amazing what dissembleth out of a hatred person is their lips. Hmm? I said this the other night, you can defend it, everything but a lie. Right. We find that he that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. Not only does he dissemble, but he's deceitful. And he lays up deceit. He looks for other ways to hurt people. Goes on to say, when he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Can I say there are some people that end up in church that God didn't put them there. The devil did to try and tear everything up. And can I say... If he goes unchecked, the devil will tear everything up. Amen. The devil hates church. The devil doesn't want you to get help. The devil doesn't want you to get victory. The devil don't want you to have the peace of God ruling in your heart. The devil doesn't want anything but misery in your life. Because if you're saved by the good grace of God and you're miserable, you're never going to point anybody else to Jesus. Amen. Can I say... There are these type of people that the devil plants in churches. I preached a message years ago on being in God's garden and not belonging there. You know, if you've got a garden, you, you're subject to have other things. You're subject to have weeds. Miss Annette was uh, voicing the other day. We was out working in the yard, and she loves working in the yard. We was working in the yard. She says, how come when it don't rain for eight or nine days, the grass don't grow, but weeds don't stop growing? Because they are watered from a different source. Hmm? So in, in a garden you'll not only have whatever you're trying to grow, vegetables or flowers, but weeds will grow. You know what else you'll have in gardens? Don't belong there? Rocks. Rocks will prohibit whatever you want to grow to grow. Can I say there are some Rocks planted in God's garden. He didn't plant them there. Amen. Rocks impede growth. Can I say something about rocks? They're hard-headed. Hmm? You also have critters in the garden. Miss Annette every year find, looks for something to find something to put on all of her flowers and plants because trust me, she's got a fortune in flowers and plants in our house. And, and every year, springtime, I know it's coming. All winter, I grieve. I know it's coming. She's going to want to plant things, which means I got the shovel in. I'm digging holes. Uh, I could care less about all that stuff, but that's her thing. Uh, and she's already told me, if I die, you've got to keep all this up. I said, I'm going before you. We're going in the rapture because I ain't keeping all that mess up. All right. I said, ain't no way. 
But every year she looks for things to put on there to keep bugs from biting them plants and eating them plants, keep rabbits from eating them plants and them flowers and all that, because critters will tear up your stuff. Amen. Huh? Some of you that live in the country, you know deer will eat your garden up. Huh? Groundhogs. Uh, they'll get in there. I'm telling you, critters can get even the most little fuzzy little loving bunny. How many of you think bunnies are so cute? But don't talk, don't talk to him and them. They used to kill them. Uh, they'd raise them and kill them. Uh, tastes just like chicken, they tell me. Anyway, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm saying you get critters in your garden, it's going to mess your garden up. Can I say? The devil's a snake himself. He may just slither into your garden. Are you listening? Mm, this is none of the message. I'm just having a good time. All right? I'm just trying to say... God commissioned his church to preach the gospel. And God fitly framed us together in his church so that he can minister through his church not only to our uh, uh, location, but Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other most parts of it, that we can be a blessing to other communities uh, and we can help missionaries across the world. Uh, but also, God knew we needed one another. I don't know about you, but I need you. I need to come to the house of God. I need to feel the Spirit of God working in God's people. Uh, I need uh, uh, the uh, handshake of fellowship. Uh, I need to be around people that are like-minded because I get tired and worn down uh, being out in this world and listening to the junk of this world. Uh, I like to come in and get some help in the house of God. Uh, and can't do that without you. But the devil wants to mess all that up. But I'm not preaching on any of that. I'm not, Brother Phil. I'm interested, though, on something in verse 23. Verse 23 says, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot sheared covered with silver dross. I got to reading that yesterday and thinking about that. And I'll preach on this thought for a little bit this morning. I want to preach on silver-plated Christians. Again, the Bible says that burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot sheared covered with silver dross. Silver-plated Christians. Can I say this first of all about silver-plated Christians? Can I say they're unsettled? Silver-plated Christians are unsettled. In other words, they're not grounded. Hmm? Can I say there are a lot of people that come to the house of God uh, that listen to the Bible being taught, that listen to Bible preaching, that carry a Bible, but they don't know anything about the Bible. Amen. They're not grounded in the Bible. They've never got settled. Uh, 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 they'll tell you they're saved. They can tell you how they got saved, but they can't tell you in the Bible where it tells you how to get saved. They're not grounded uh, in what it is to be a child of God, uh, what it is to walk circumspectly in this world, uh, what it is uh, uh, to be a separated people unto God, what it is uh, 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 to be a, 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 a rudiment uh, above the rudiments of this world, to be a, 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 the, a joint heir to the throne of Christ. And they cannot tell you uh, what the Bible teaches about anything. You mentioned Baptist distinctives. They have no idea. They have no idea what baptism really is other than you get wet. They have no idea what the table really represents. Uh, they really don't know uh, what the office of the pastor is to do, what the office of the deacons are to do. Uh, they really don't know anything about true Baptist distinctives. Uh, and the qualifications there are because they're not grounded. Hmm? Can I say, you plant something, but you don't plant it deep enough it's not going to take root, and it don't take much to blow it over. And can I say, folks that are not grounded, that are unsettled, uh, my dear friends, it don't take much to blow them over. Amen. They're unsettled. They're just not grounded. I've went to church with people, you ask them a question about the Bible, and they look at you like they have no idea. You can tell, obviously, Brother Phil, they don't read it. No, they, don't. they don't study it. They don't know what it says. Uh, 
And by the way, that's a dangerous thing that you base everything you believe on what I say. Uh, friend, you're going to be judged by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Uh, uh, the reason you ought to carry your Bibles, make sure I'm reading you what God said. Uh, but you yourself are responsible to learn it uh, and to understand what thus saith the Lord. Uh, Silver-plated Christians are unsettled. They just don't get grounded. Can I say this? They just don't seem to fit. Anybody ever do a jigsaw puzzle? Three of us. My problem is, is if I get involved in a jigsaw puzzle, I can't quit till it's done. And back during COVID, Sydney had the idea we were going to a family do a jigsaw puzzle, and she bought one with about 150,000 pieces. And they were real little pieces. And everyone looked at the same. And I was so glad when her, her and Jordan got that thing done because I was about ready to throw it out the window. But what I'm saying is some of them pieces look like they fit. They is the right shape. And they is the right color. Amen. But Miss Pam, you put it in there and it just didn't go. I mean, even hit it with your fist. And it didn't go. And can I say there are some that are silver-plated Christians that come uh, and you hit them over the head with the Word of God, uh, but they just don't seem to fit. Amen. Because they're unsettled. Listen, I can go anywhere where there's a house assembled of believers and feel like I fit in. As long as God's there. I've been some places where God's put Ichabod over the door and I felt weird while I was there. Hmm? Huh? I'm just telling it like it is. Huh? And I've been some places where they had some of them singers that did the window washing, but God wasn't there. But listen, I was just in Grenada three weeks ago with folks that didn't look like me. They didn't sound like me. I'd never met them before, but it's like we'd known each other all our lives. Yep. Yeah. And we love one another. Sure. And them young ladies love Miss Annette. I mean, for church, uh, they was on her like fleas on a dog. I mean, they just loved her. Uh, and we just fit. We just had a time. Uh, I can go to Georgia and we'll here in a couple of uh, months uh, and I'll just fit. Uh, I'll be in Hazard next month. I'll just fit. Uh, I'll be in Pennington Gap, Virginia next month. I'll just fit. Uh, I'll be in Morristown, Tennessee uh, and I'll just fit. Uh, hey, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Uh, and hey, when you're uh, around his people and you got his spirit and they got his spirit, hey, you just fit. But I've seen some come here for a long time and they just never fit. Now, I don't know what the deal is, Brother Phil. I'm just telling the truth. They just don't fit. I understand not everybody's going to be like you. Praise the Lord. If I had a whole church like you, this would be my nerves. No, I wouldn't. No, I love Brother Phil. I'd take a hundred just like him. Don't know what I'd do with him, but I'd take a hundred just like him. I'm just telling you, we don't have to be exactly the same. But we do fit when he's on the inside. You got him on the front row. I mean, he's got ants in his pants ready to shout right now. And then you got Brother Clint sitting right here, and he's about as backward as they come. And they're two polar opposite people. But God gets to move, and they just fit. How'd that happen, God? No, I'm saying silver-plated Christians, they're just unsettled. Can I say something else about them? They're unsatisfied. Silver-plated Christians are never joyful. I've seen people have the worst circumstances in your life that you can think of and still have joy. Where's my, where's my Aunt Lynn? There you are. You move every service. Can't ever find you. You remember Lucy See, Moorfield's husband died. She didn't have two nickels to rub together. I remember my grandpa used to call me and say, Boy, I was always bad when he called me boy. Pick me up early. That meant before the sun come up. 
And so I'd go over to my grandpa's house and we'd load up. He had a big Buick Electra 225. The trunk could put your car in it. And he'd load that thing up with bushels of green beans and tomatoes and stuff he'd grown. And we'd go all over the country, you know, just giving those to church members. But I, I never forget, he'd say, boy, meet me early. We'd go to Miss Lucy's house. And we'd be out there, we'd pick her green beans, and we'd pick her tomatoes, and we'd do all that. And I used to get so frustrated, them two old people picked twice as many green beans as I could, you know. But I'll never forget, that woman didn't have anything. And she'd come to the house of God, have the sweetest spirit, and she'd just start singing, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Amen. So what happened? Heaven fell in that place. Amen. What happened? Amen. Huh? Amen. She didn't have much of this world's goods, Miss Crystal, but she had joy. Huh? Silver-plated Christians, they're never joyful. All they talk about is their problems. Let me help you. I, this, this is very enlightening. This is a lightning bolt from heaven. Everybody has problems. If you'd quit looking at Brother Donald thinking he's got no problems, you'd realize that he's got problems too, and you know what? God's bigger than your problems. But you don't have any joy because you don't look to God. You're looking around. Everybody's got problems. Sure huh? Do. Joseph, you got any problems? Yeah, you got some problems. You don't you ain't even old enough to know what a problem is, but you got problems, don't you? Huh? Your principal's really rough on you, I know. And Charlie's the teacher's pet. I know that. You got problems, huh? Miss Melissa, you got problems? I know you got problems. Most of you don't know Miss Melissa's mother, she's having to take care of her all the time. Her mother's health is failing. Her mind's failing. I want to tell you something. When you've got a loved one that don't recognize you anymore, that breaks your heart. And it's all she can do to find somebody else to watch so she gets to come to church. That's a problem. Huh? But yet here she is. She's not moaning about her problems. She's sitting on the front row wanting to worship. I want to tell you, everybody's got problems. We all do. We've got physical problems. We've got financial problems. We've got family problems. We've got problems. But those that are silver-plated, they're never satisfied no matter what happens. God can bless them abundantly, and instead of seeing all the good blessings of God, they say, God could have given me more. They're never joyful. They never seem complete. I've seen people say, boy, if I just get a new house, everything would be great to get a new house. And then they realize it's the same family living in the new house, lived in the old house. That's right. I've seen people, oh, if I can get a new car, everything would be great and get a new car, everything's great until they get the payment book. Oh, if I, could, if I could get a new spouse, or if I could get a new this, or if I can get a new that. The problem when you get new stuff is it ends up getting old. Amen. And it's old stuff. There's no contentment. You know what the Bible says? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Yes, but silver played to Christians never get there. And they're never complete. Can I say this? They're not only unsettled and unsatisfied, they're unsubmissive. Silver-plated Christians are disobedient. It don't matter what the preacher preaches on, they're, they're not going to do it. They're going to do what they want to do. They're going to see the path that they want to see, and it's okay because they see it. Doesn't matter what the Bible says. Amen. Matters what they think. Let me help you with something. There is no gray area with God. God pinned it down and that settled it, whether you believe it or not. And you'll never be happy. You'll never have joy. You'll never have the peace of God. You'll never, ever uh, 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 experience the fullness of God doing, dis doing exactly what He said not to do. Amen. When you're disobedient, you'll never have the blessings of God. Mm, they're just unsubmissive. I've known people in times gone by you call it black, they call it white. You call it white, they call it black. They'll do exactly the opposite of what the preacher says just because they, in their spirit, do not want to submit. Amen. Can I say? They're silver-plated Christians. 
If you study the Bible, you'll find everyone that came to Jesus, the first thing they did was submit. The madman of Gadara, they found him clothed and in his right mind, and when Jesus went to leave, he wanted to go with him. You find Bartimaeus, when he received his sight, he continued with Jesus in the way. You'll find Zacchaeus. You'll find all of them. When Zacchaeus got born again, he went and he repaid everybody that he'd done wrong. Folks that get right with God, do what's right. Amen. Folks got a problem doing what God says, they're silver-plated Christians. Can I say this about silver-plated Christians? They're unsocial. You say, what do you mean? They're unfriendly. Bible says you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. So if you're not friendly, uh, you don't have any friends, you know who that's on? You. Right. Amen. Mm. If you're friendly, you'll get a friend. Even when you pick on them. Joseph, are you my friend? Yeah. Do I pick on you? But you're my friend. Shake my hand, boy. I didn't put it out there for the It's not offering time. Just shake my hand. Huh? It's no secret having friends. You just got to be friendly. It's amazing if you smile at somebody, they just smile back. But can I say that silver-plated Christians are unsocial. They choose not to have friends. Amen. They choose not to hang around God's people. Now, they'll make a myriad of excuses why they can't or why they won't, but the bottom line is... They don't want to be around God's people. Right. Because here's the reality. If you hang around this guy long enough, he might rub off on you. You might be on the front row shouting your lungs out too. But can I say a silver-plated Christian don't want to be this guy? Silver-plated Christian wants to be one step from the morgue. They don't, they, don't like, they don't like being around God's people because sure. they get under conviction. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that killed the message right there. Can I say silver-plated Christians are unsolicited? Solicited, solicious. Say that for me, Jordan. Solicious. Unsolicious. That's what I try to say, unsolicious. See, when you got lips as fat as mine, sometimes they beat together and it gets tough. The real problem was when I, when I had that cancer surgery, they took pieces out of my tongue, and there are some words that I used to say that I can't say. They look good on paper, but I can't say them anymore. But they're unsolicious. What does that mean? They're never complimentary of anybody else. They're always critical. Can I say, if you are always critical, I am not going to hang around you. Amen. That brings me down. Yeah. Listen, we can find fault in anybody. Or anything. It's easy to do. Huh? We tend to not find fault when we look in the mirror. But we can find fault. And it's easy to be critical. But it's not Christian to be critical. We're to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we should not be critical all the time. Now some things you need to be critical about. If it goes against the Bible, you need to make sure people know that. It's more being truthful than critical, but I'm talking about this crowd. They never compliment anybody. They'll never say, oh, Miss Crystal looks nice today. No, they'll say, well, she should have wore something better than that. Oh, doesn't Seth look colorful? Let's see. Seth looks effeminate, wearing pink. They're critical. Huh? Folks are always critical when they're silver-plated. Sure. Can I say this about silver-plated Christians? They just may be. I'm not saying they are. But they just may be unsaved. 
I don't know, but if the Spirit of God lives in you, you can't constantly be unsettled, and you can't constantly be unsatisfied, and you can't constantly be unsubmissive, and you can't constantly be unsocial, and you can't constantly be unsolicitous. You can't constantly be that if the Spirit of God lives in you. Sooner or later, you're going to get miserable enough to turn back to God. But you can get a far enough away from God, you act like all those things. They just might be unsaved. I'm about done, but I want you to look at verse 23 again. Everything I've said to this point has led up to what I'm about to tell you right now, because this is what I saw when I read this yesterday. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot sheared covered with silver draws. Now, a pot sheared was a broken and sharp piece of pottery. They didn't have knives like we have knives in a lot of instances. So they would tend to scrape things and cut things with a pot sheared. If you remember when Job lost all he had, he went and he sat down in the ashes. He didn't even have anything to sacrifice anymore, so he gave the Lord himself. Uh, and when Satan struck him with the boils, he took a pot sheared and he scraped the boils off of his flesh. So we see a pot sheared, a broken, sharp piece of pottery. But then we see it's covered with silver dross. Now, what happened with silver. They'd put it in a cauldron and they'd melt it. They'd put it under fire. And as that silver would get hot, the impurities would come to the top and they'd scrape the impurities off and throw it to the side. And they'd do that continually till the silversmith could look into that pot and look into that silver and see his own reflection. Then he knew it was pure. The, what they scraped off and threw to the side was called the dross. Can I say, dross was waste. The dross was scum. The dross was rejected as worthless. Nobody ever took the dross and said, boy, I've got it made. Look at the dross. They wanted the silver. Now, I've talked a lot about silver-plated Christians, but silver Christians are a whole lot different. You see, silver in the Bible means redemption. There are a lot of people that's got a silver plate. They know Christ in name only. But true Christians are silver. Now, can I say something about silver? Silver makes a different sound than silver plated. I just so happen to have in my little pouch here two coins. Don't worry, Jordan, they're not yours. Uh, the first one is a silver dollar. This silver dollar was stamped in commemorative of our nation's 200th anniversary. It was done in 1976. Hear it? That coin is silver plated. If you look on the edges, you can see it's got other metals in it, usually tin. Now this silver dollar came from 1892 when you was first born. This coin is solid silver. Makes a different sound. Has a different ring to it. Can I say? Silver Christians make a different sound. Huh? Their sound and their speech is different. Hmm? It's not the speech they had before they got saved. And what comes out of their mouth is praise unto God. A song unto God. Glory unto God. They can't help but want to please the Lord. They sound different. Real silver sounds different. Can I say something else about real silver as opposed to silver plated? Real silver is solid. Yeah. 
This isn't solid silver. This is. Can I say, real Christians, they get grounded. They become solid in individuals for the cause of Christ. You can count on them. Hmm? There's some people I can't count on. There's some people in this church I know even if it snows a blizzard, I don't call off church, they're going to be here. If something doesn't happen and they're not providentially hindered, they're going to be here. You can count on them. You just know they're going to be there. Why? Because they're solid. They've gotten things settled a long time ago. Real silver as opposed to silver plate it makes a different sound. It's solid. And lastly, can I say this? Real silver is more salable. You say, what's that mean? I said, it means it's worth more. He said, Brother Doug, you said it's both silver dollars. I did say that. And they will give you a dollar for this one. But you can take this one to a coin shop. And even though it's worn pretty good, you'll still get nine, ten dollars for this one. Depending on a year, you might get more than that. Might get twenty, twenty-five dollars for it. Huh? It's worth more. Huh? And can I say, those that are solid silver, they're worth more to Christ. They're worth more to the church. And they just carry themselves like they're worth more. They don't sell out their they don't sell out their Savior for thirty pieces of this. Hmm? Hmm? So can I say this morning? Do you know for sure that you're silver? Or are you silver plated? Because silver plated Christians are involved in all that stuff we talked about, all that tail bearing, backbiting and strife and all of that. That's what silver plated does silver saints they just live and praise the Lord which one are you today do you know the Lord if you don't you can the moment we're going to have an invitation we we'll invite you to come to him we, we'd love to, to, to introduce you to him can you go back to a place where you met him if not you can't meet him and if you're here today and you're saved but your life looks more like it's silver plated why don't you, get, why don't you take a step up why don't you get closer to God? Draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. Why don't you let God do a work in your heart and settle you? Why don't you let Him ground you? Why don't you let Him do something for you? Why don't you let the Word of God be perfected in your life? Why don't you let Him do something in your life? Because life's too short to have silver-plated Christians. This world ought to see a difference. Amen. What are you today? Let's all stand, Brother Clint, if you'll come get a song of invitation. While he's coming, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. Thank you for helping us with the message. Lord, I hate when there's strife, when there's dissemblance, when there's envy, when there's things going on in your church, and I know you hate it more. So God, I, I thank you for folks that are like-minded and folks that love and folks that want to serve God. I thank you for that crowd. Thank you for folks who, Lord, aren't just Christian in name. And God, I pray today there be any amongst us that are unsaved, that they get saved. Maybe somebody's been silver-plated. They've been saved, but, Lord, their life isn't what it should be. Pray they'd get it the way it needs to be, get it right with the Lord. I just pray you'd do a work in our hearts that, Lord, we can impact this community. And God, we can make a difference in the lives of others. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd bless in this invitation and you'd get glory from our lives. We'll thank you and praise you for it. For it's in the wonderful, glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.